bitches, every city in my tribe. Uh, look, 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 look behind. Booty dominate the world, peaches ripe. Hello. Hi. Yay. I am sorry about that. I am. God, that got last guy. I'm just like. <laughs> I'm just like my blood vessels are breaking, just from that last guy who was on. <laughs> um, yeah, Jesus. this is Aaron, y'all. Uh, so, Aaron, what okay. I, you tell people Go what ahead. you do for a living. Sure. I feel like you're, 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 you're take on this. Yeah. So let me get myself in a better lighting position. Um, okay. So my current role right now is I am a sexual violence prevention advocate and coordinator. Um, and my previous job was a sexual health educator. And so I provide education to a range of um, ages, but this recent position was about um, serving students who are on the autism spectrum that are in the 18 to 24 year range. But now I'm switching over to a different field. Is that a good summary? No, that was a great summary. So, um... So what what are your thoughts on the conversation? Oh my god. Okay. So clearly this guy has never worked at a domestic violence shelter or even in some sort of agency that deals in sex trafficking. Like clearly. Um, so the book he referenced, I've heard this argument before, but it's basically this conspiracy linked idea that this book is grooming kids to be basically poached into sex trafficking and it's just like not even the case. And so he's referring to coded words that show up in like chat rooms or discord rooms or just in whatever like social media service for sex trafficking. So at one point uh, law enforcement and agencies started seeing the, the letter CP for child pornography. And so people were trading child pornography, for example. And agencies caught up to that. And we realized afterwards they started switching their language to use cheese pizza. Okay. So cheese pizza became an anal an analog well, it became analogous to child pornography. <laughs> this book uses cheese pizza as a reference for humor, but for whatever reason it's caught on thinking that it's grooming kids for sex trafficking. It's just oh <laughs> this the dumbest thing. It's just so infuriating that someone has grappled onto this false information and is running with it. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah, because I don't even know how, like, that would translate. Like, it's not even child. weird. It's yeah. a literal, like, humorous book that talks about cheese pizza, but it has nothing to do with sex trafficking. <laughs> it's like... Um, and this is, I can't remember when this happened, but there was, um, kind of this explosion of concern for a lot of people whenever they would see the news on oh, who was that guy who killed himself in prison because he was caught red handed. Yeah. So ever since Epstein, that sort of caused people to pay attention, but people are being taken advantage of by just conspiracy, um, creators so it's just like um but there was more to that conversation that was a problem too um this idea that like for some reason our collective mental health degradation is brought upon the the disassociating or the what do you call the um the diffusing of the nuclear family and what I find really strange is that there are plenty of instances where there are perf perfectly looking families with members in that family who have tons of mental health issues. So yeah. the structure of the family has no bearing or, or any predictable power on what mental health concerns happen. So, I, I'm glad you said that because I did almost bring up to him, but obviously it's anecdotal because it's my experience. I was raised by my mother and my grandmother yeah. Um, and our home was very happy, very healthy. Um, my cousins had the traditional mother father, but, um, so their father and my mother were, were siblings and they came from a very abusive home. 
And yeah. I would even be as confident to say as my uncle suffered, uh, ha had a huge, was very, had toxic masculinity. And yeah. I feel that that has done more damage to my male cousin than even right. though he was raised in a traditional household, then, you know, me being fatherless mm -hmm. in, in my household. There's a really good term. Um, it basically summarizes into toxic masculinity, but it's called hegemonic masculinity. And it's about uh, the gender roles splice in with family roles or sort of like family structures. And a lot of men, for example, experience suicide or suicide ideation, for example, because they've been put on this railway towards this goal or this sort of social script. And they have no way to define actually what it is that makes them happy, whether they even want to be in a family or a relationship at all. Um, and so wow. many, many men start families and they're unhappy because they've been given this script to go with it but they never were given the tools to assess whether or not this is what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's hegemonic masculinity. It's this dominant idea of what it means to be a man that overrides our feelings and our authenticity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I find it interesting that the last person was talking about, Oh gosh. Um, if, like, if uh, there was a comparison from purity culture to what cult hookup culture? Hookup culture. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of problems with hookup culture. Like, there's communication problems, um, but those also persist in other sort of cultures or structures too. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, communication is uh, it's so, just hard no matter where <laughs> where are you at. I I feel yeah. Like communication. Yeah. yeah, I wish we really would like have more emphasis on that as a society. Yeah, me too. Um, like, honestly, it's not just communication, but also vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm. And I often argue that hookup culture benefits men the most uh, because it's basically this sort of market and access to women's bodies. And there's, there's no vulnerability. There's no discussion on connection. Mm -hmm. There's no consideration on the emotional impact of these behaviors. And so I, for example, I wouldn't discourage people from hooking up. I would just rather they take into account like what sort of emotional impact this is going to have on them themselves sure. or other people. No, that's um, fair. Yeah. I've been in lots of situations just in the dating world um, where Many people were reaching out to me for, you know, using the apps. Um, I came across, for example, one woman who wanted to sleep with me, but I was like, I don't do that. And we've and come to find out that talking with her was actually a much more just impactful experience than having sex with her. Because <laughs> we didn't have sex, thankfully, thank God. Um, and just being able to connect with people has been... For me, a really important aspect of just learning like what kind of misogyny is out there and how many men just don't talk to women. They don't relate to women. No, that's, I, also, I, I, that's also part of uh, hegemonic masculinity. That's an interesting uh, term. I'm going to write that down and look into it. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I do need to go to yep, another. You got to go. So thank you. As yeah, we'll always, talk on Tuesday. Yes, we'll talk yeah. on Tuesday. All right. Yep. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. I'm so fucking cute, bitch I'm so fucking cute